Let everybody come on in and get settled. Good to see you all this morning. We are back in our class on the book of Revelation. Uh, we are in the letters to the seven churches right now, and we're down to chapter 3, verse 7. The letter to the church in Philadelphia. Chapter 3, verse 7. And to the messenger of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, who is true, he who has the key of David, and he who opens, and no one shuts and shuts, and no one opens. I know your works. I see I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those who have the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie, Indeed, I will make them come and worship before you, your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Uh, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, and that no one may take, it, take your crown. He who, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He will go out. He shall go out no more. Uh, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, uh, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven uh, from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Uh, the congregation in Philadelphia, uh, what he has to say about it, uh, you're going to be seeing it, is that even though they have a little strength, he has nothing bad to say about them. Th th this is what you want. You, you won't when the Lord is telling you about yourself as a congregation because he's in our midst. He sees the reality of where we are. He knows our works. He knows where we are collectively. He knows where we are individually. And speaking about the congregation here in uh, the city of Philippi, he has nothing but good to say about them. That's what we want. That's what we want. Uh, he says here in the close of verse 7, uh, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. That's actually... Uh, a, a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 22 and verse 22. Isaiah 22 and 22, uh, we're prophesying about the Christ. It says, the key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder, so he shall open and no one shall shut, and he shall shut and no one shall open. When he's talking about the key of the house of David, he's talking about authority. Uh, that the authority of the Christ is going to be laid on his shoulder. The idea of the key, if you know what a key does, it opens the door and it shuts the the door. If you have the authority over the key, you're the one that determines when the door is open, when the door is shut, and if the door is going to stay open, the door is going to stay shut. See how that works? Talks about the key, and then he talks about opening and shutting, and no one, if he opens it, can shut it. There are so many verses that are on this particular concept of a door being shut. Do you remember, for instance, I'm going to tell on the outline, I'm just going from ahead if you don't mind. Uh, do you remember over there in the text of the, of the chapter Matthew, Matthew chapter 25, when you have the parable of the five wise and the five foolish virgins. Okay, when the five foolish virgins came after the bridegroom had gone in, what had happened to the door? It was shut. What does it mean the door is shut? You can't come in. All right, in the context of Matthew 25, where is it actually? That, what's, that whole text is dealing with trying to go to heaven, folks. We're not, we're talk, we're not talking about going to a wedding. He's just using the example of the wedding, that people want to go to the wedding just because you want to go to the wedding doesn't mean you're going to be allowed to go to the wedding. The door being shut, though, is the idea that you had opportunity. You should have been ready before. You weren't ready, and because you weren't ready when the Lord came, the door is shut. Let me put it to you this way. On Judgment Day, how many people are going to want to go to heaven? Everybody. Well, when judgment day comes, can you obey the gospel that morning before the Lord comes? And, 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 uh, or can you, let's put it another way, can you obey it after he comes? No, it's judgment day. <laughs> it's judgment day. The whole point is it's here. And so since that's the reality of it, when should we be ready? Now. Stay ready now. Obey the gospel now. Get right with God now. Stay ready now. Always be in the now in your relationship with God. Because if he shuts the door, it stays shut. But if he opens the door, it stays open. He says here in verse 8, See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, 
uh, for you have a little strength. Two things I want to look at here. First of all, the clothes of the t that what I have in yellow tint for you, for you have a little strength. I've told you all this before. One of the most common questions I get when I go out and travel out doing gospel meetings is this. How many people attend where you preach? I, I, I've probably been asked that question hundreds of times. And I've always wanted to go five. Because if I say five, what's going to be in the mind of the people? You're a terrible preacher. <laughs> what's wrong with you? There's only five of you? Okay, what if I say 5,000? Oh, you're a good preacher. Wow. What's the problem? We're determining strength of congregations by what's on the board. See how that works? How many people attend where you preach? How many meetings do you hold? That's the second most common question. How many meetings do you hold? I've always said, well, it's 20, or one, or none. What's that all about? You're a really good preacher if you hold 20. You're a terrible preacher if you hold one. We make the mistake of determining strength by numbers. The text here, you're dealing with a congregation that has little strength. But he hasn't got anything but good to say about him. The point I'm trying to make, you can have a congregation of five people, they can be awesomely strong. You can have a congregation of 5,000, they can be dead, dead, dead. Strength is not determined by numbers. Strength is determined by your relationship with God and your faithfulness to your God, collectively and individually. The congregation in Philadelphia, they had it to where even though they had little strength, they were faithful. They kept his word. They did not deny his name. The concept of denying his name, you've got to understand the context here. You remember going back to chapter 1, verse 10, how the devil was about to cast some of you into prison? You're going to have tribulation 10 days, be faithful unto death, and they give you the crown of life. That, that's what the book is about. Christians being tried for their faith, being tested for their faith. And if you study the letter from Pliny to Trajan, uh, you will find that the way in which the trial of a Christian took place is they would set a bust of the statue of, of the emperor in front of the individual being tried, and they would tell them to worship it and renounce Christ. See, there's two things there. Worship the image and renounce Christ. The Christians here refused to do that. They didn't deny his name. They would die holding on to the fact that Christ is the king. And his word, in their lives, they were obeying Christianity. They were following the word of God individually, and they were not going to deny the name of Christ. That's what he's warning of the people here. Be willing to die for your faith. But he tells them here that he set before them an open door. Now, what is an open door? This particular phrase is used several times in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 14, verse 27. Now, when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them, and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So you see here the concept of an open door is a door of opportunity to take the word of God, to preach the word of God. Now again, try to take yourself back and put yourself in the shoes of the people in the there and then. If brethren in your congregation are being arrested, and you're the preacher, <laughs> or you're a member of that congregation, how are you going to feel about openly confessing Christ, not only openly confessing it, but preaching the word of God openly? Uh, a little uneasy because if I go out and I preach in the street corner, I'm going to be taken probably arrested by the end of the day. Uh, and even if I go house to house, there's a good chance that we're all going to get arrested and I'm going to be put to death. Do, do you understand the pressure that Christians of the there and then are under? Well, here the Lord is telling them, I've opened a door for you, a door of opportunity. So what are they supposed to do when the door is open? Go in, go into it, go through it. Bring it down home today. Does God still open doors today? Yeah, he does. A door is an opportunity. An opportunity for you to interact with another human being, to, to live Christianity in front of them, to teach them Christianity in words and in deed. Keep your eyes open for open doors. By the way, if a door opens in front of you, I don't mind giving you advice, but don't ask me to go through your door for you. Do you understand what I just said? If a door of opportunity opens for you, I don't mind you coming to me and asking me advice, but don't say, oh, a door is open, Wayne, door. See how that works? 
Well, hey, we got all the kind of these doors, so when you go through all the doors, we got, we're going to go do something else. I don't know as much as you do, Wayne, so you go through the door. You're better at talking than I am when you go through the door. I, by the way, I don't mind going through doors. That's what I do. But I'm trying to encourage you to go through the door yourself. One of the best ways to learn the Bible is to have a Bible study with somebody. <laughs> and have them start asking you a question that you don't know the answer to. And what are you going to do if you don't know the answer? I still have that happen, folks. You'll ask me questions sometime and I go, I already don't know the answer to that. Give me some time and I'll go study it, okay? And then you go and you study it. And you come back and you tell them what you found and why you believe what you believe about it from the scriptures. You're not going to learn how to do this unless you do it. You just got to do it. And you got to keep your eyes open for the open doors. Because if the Lord opens the door, nobody can shut it. In the context here, no one was going to be able to stop these individuals from preaching the word of God and going through the open doors. And not only that, because they had not denied the name of Christ and they'd held to his word, the persecution that was going to come was not going to come upon them. What an encouraging message. Just go through the doors. Go through the doors. Do the work. You find the same concept in 1 Corinthians 16, 8 through 9. But I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effective door is open to me, and there are many adversaries. So if there are many adversaries, does that mean you don't go through the door? No, you still go through the door. Yes? Yes. There are people there in Matthew 23 that were wanting to obey the gospel. Matthew 23 is the most scathing rebuke, I believe, in the New Testament. And one of the things they're being rebuked for is there were individuals that were wanting to enter in, and the Pharisees were doing everything they could to prevent them from going into Christianity. Are there people still like that in the world today? Oh, yes. Yes, they still exist. I could tell you story after story after story of people who were ostracized by their family because they obeyed the gospel. A lot of them you know. You just don't know what happened to them and what they went through to become a Christian, how their family basically kicked them out, ostracized them completely because they had the audacity to obey the gospel. Um, the gospel is spreading in India right now. And uh, in one of the last reports I got from some of the preachers in India the people who are obeying the gospel are now being persecuted. Not so much being threatened, but not being allowed to walk through the city. If you want to go anything on the other side of the city, you have to walk around the city. The Hindu elders won't allow the Christians who are members of that community to walk through the city anymore. Uh, so the point I'm trying to make is there's still parts of the world where if you're going to be a Christian, you're going to have adversaries. You're going to have persecution. You're going to have folks who are going to try to stop you as the Pharisees were trying to prevent people from obeying the gospel. But again, if there is, and look at the way he's described it here, a great and effective door. Uh, when Paul stayed in Ephesus, how long did he stay there? Three years. Three years. That's a lot of work. He went through a lot of doors. And uh, you think of all the congregations that were planted and watered during that time period. As a matter of fact, I would go as far as saying a lot of these congregations that you have the seven letters to probably were influenced by Paul at one time. These are in the same location. Ephesus, Ephesus, okay. And then around Ephesus, that's where he worked out from. And so Paul, going through those doors, that's why these congregations exist. Oh, that's a great comment. The key of the house of David, he's the Christ. He, he is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. If you don't know about that in 2 Samuel 7, 12 and following, the Davidic covenant was a promise about the kingdom and the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. He has the authority as the Christ, not only for the Jew, but also for the Gentile. And if he opens a door for Gentiles, and so be it. Excellent comment there, David. Excellent. Yes. And, and, and so... Let's go and talk a little bit about these Jews. Verse 9 through 10. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Were they, probably, were they probably physically descendants of Abraham? 
Yes, probably. Can't prove it, but probably were. But were they following God? No. No. And so rather than following God by submitting to God and coming to God through the Christ, through Jesus, they were fighting against it. According to church history, whenever Christians were being turned in to the authorities in different parts of the Roman Empire, if there were Jews who lived in the area, they would turn them in. Again, that's history, take it or leave it. But here we understand that these individuals that call themselves Jews are in reality, rather than being servants of God, are servants of Satan. Uh, and again, if you go back and you study the work of the Apostle Paul in his missionary journeys, whenever he would go into a city, if there was a synagogue, that's where he'd go first. The Jews first and then the Gentiles. But then he would go into the Jews, and if uh, there was a lot of the Jews that would not obey the gospel, some of them would, and they would come out of it. And then he would go to the Gentiles. What would happen, and what did happen when Paul and Barnabas went to the Gentiles, the entire city turned out? Who created the uprising? The Jews. The Jews that did not believe, and that's the key crucial part, right? that did not believe. The Jews that did not believe were the ones who started the first great persecution against the church being led by Paul, Saul of Tarsus. And from that point forward, those who did not believe made Christianity their primary purpose of wiping it out. And so they may call themselves servants of God, they're actually the synagogue of Satan. Uh, let's go back over to Romans 2, 8, 28 to 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. In Christianity, under the new covenant, the covenant of the Christ, does it matter about your physical lineage? No. Doesn't matter anymore. Under Judaism, did it matter? Yeah, you could be a proselyte, but if you were born Jewish, that's it. You're Jewish. Here he's trying to show under the new covenant who a real Jew is. And he's talking about his spiritual relationship with God. It is no longer outward. It is no longer of the flesh. It has to do with your heart. It has to do with whether or not you are going to remove the old man in repentance and put on Christ and then live by faith and obey the will of God in the Christ. Are you going to be a Christian? Are you going to follow God and his word? If they rejected Jesus as the Christ, how's that going to work out for them in judgment day? The door is shut and no one can open it. If you don't go to God God's way, you're not going to go. You remember what Jesus said over in John 14, I believe it's 6? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Somebody finish it for me. No man shall come unto the Father except through me. Is that narrow-minded? It's the facts. <laughs> it's the facts. Uh, how about this? There's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism. Is that narrow-minded? No, it's the facts. I will be as narrow-minded as the scriptures are narrow. Can I make the narrow way broader if I want to? No, I have no authority, folks. I'm not the Christ. I'm just a guy. We have no authority to make the narrow way broader. We couldn't do it even if we wanted to. What the point I'm trying to make is if we're going to go to heaven, we've got to go to heaven God's way. We've got to go to heaven God's way. Through the Christ. If you don't go through the Christ, you don't go. The door is shut. Revelation 3, 11 through 12. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a, 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 a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. Oh, I, by the way, I'm sorry, my brain won't let go of something. I want to go back to the open door real quick. If you go through the open door and you're working with somebody, if they don't obey the gospel, is it your fault? No. 
If you go after someone and they don't come back, is it your fault? No, no, no. You remember the parable of the sower? Yeah, the wayside soil. Is there a problem with the seed? No. You remember the, the rocky soil? Is there a problem with the seed? You remember the thorny ground? Is there a problem with the seed? There's no problem with the seed. Where's the problem? The soil. The soil is where the problem is. And so if you take the word of God to somebody and they don't respond to it, the point I'm trying to make, it's not your fault. So don't start saying, I should have done better. What did I do wrong? I didn't approach it right. It's his word. Carry his word to the soil. And his word will not return to him void according to Isaiah. There, got that out of my head. Sorry. <laughs> Sometimes my brain goes, ooh, you forgot to say this. Okay, going back to this, the one who overcomes. Yes. And, it, and it's very easy to talk yourself out of going through an open door. It really is. Do you understand the concept of selective planting? In the parable of the sower, what is he doing with the seed? Reaches in the bag. Does he go and poke a hole and then plant it in the seed in the ground? Or does he take it? And what does the word sow mean? I do that. That's what I do with my flower seeds. I just go to the garden and yeah, that's, that's sowing. And you just, you hope, you hope it takes root. Selective planting is the idea, and this is something we will do sometime in order not to go through an open door. We look at the individual and we think, no, they'll never obey the gospel. Not that person. Don't ever do that. Don't ever make up somebody's mind for them. Just speaking from experience, some of the people that you would least likely ever think to obey the gospel are the ones who do. And I've also learned from my experience in life, I'm not really a good judge of character sometimes. <laughs> because I thought there were people in the congregation that were just going to be amazing. They were going to be a great, and they were the rocky ground. They were amazing for a while, and they're gone. Or I couldn't tell that they were thorny ground. They get caught up in the cares of the world, they're gone. I could tell you story after story of people that I had great confidence in that burned up. That's the hardest thing in the world to work with, is watching your work burn up. There's no more painful thing than that. But I can also tell you example after example of people that I never thought would obey the gospel or much less stick with it. It did obey the gospel and became amazing. Folks, I used to preach at Parchman, Mississippi, at the state penitentiary. I could stand up here for hours and give you story after story of people that you would never expect to obey the gospel who did, and one of them is a preacher today. And so don't do selective planting. Don't make up somebody's mind for them, and don't talk yourself out of it because you're a lack of knowing how to do it yet. The power's not in you. The power's in the word. You just get the word to the soil. Okay, good comment, Jay. Getting back to the text here in the close of verse 12, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. The idea of a pillar is you're going to be there all the time. You're, 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 you're always, what, and a pillar in a temple, it's there. And it's not going to go anywhere because it's what's holding it up. It's not necessarily the idea of importance as much permanence. The idea is you will be in the temple of my God, and you will always be there. Stability. How does the Psalm 23 close? Last verse. 
and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Next word, forever. That's a pillar. The house of the Lord is the temple. A pillar is the concept of you will be in the house of God, in the temple of God, and you will always be there forever. Brethren, that's what we're trying to get to. That's what we're trying to get to. Getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, over in Revelation chapter 7, what you have in Revelation chapter 7 are those who have died for their faith in heaven, in the temple, before the throne of God. That's a whole other lesson. We'll get to that in a few weeks. But right now, the point I'm trying to make is what we're trying to get to is we're trying to get to heaven. We're trying to get to God himself is the way he's described here in the book of Revelation. And we're trying to describe ourselves in the presence of God himself in heaven. That's the goal. And in heaven for how long? Forever. That's the goal. And those who would overcome, that's what they would receive. Be faithful to death. Remember back in chapter 2? Be faithful to death and I give you the crown of life. All right, Revelation 3, 11 through 12. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and I will write on him my new name. And so you have actually three things that talks about being written on you. The name of God, the name of the city of New Jerusalem, and your new name. Okay, one of the things we're going to be seeing here in the book of Revelation, again, when we get over to the seventh chapter, partly in the sixth chapter, primarily in the seventh chapter, is what's called the sealing of those who are gods. In, in the book of Revelation, you're going to find, you're going to either going to be in one or two groups. You're either going to be in the camp of God, in the army of God, as a child of God and a servant, or you're going to be under Satan's domain. Those who are under Satan's domain, they have what's called the mark of the beast. Okay, this, this goes all the way back to ancient, ancient, ancient times, all the way back to Acadia, Sumeria, ancient civilizations, all the way up until the New Testament times, sealing a document. Sometimes they would call them signet rings. And it wasn't so much the signet ring like you see on the movies today, as it, much, it was a little scroll made out of clay that was carved. And uh, whenever you were going to seal something, that would indicate, just like it does today, by the way, with the notary public, they seal it, it's authority. I seal this with my authority. To be sealed is the idea with my authority, I am saying, I am doing this, and this is from me. Not only that, this is mine. And that's the key point. To be sealed means you are his. You belong to God. Again, the sealing of documents goes back to the very beginning of human history. And all the way through, we even still have it today, the sealing of documents. The concept of the name of God, the name of New Jerusalem, and your new name is you belong to God. Because the name of God is written on you, then when judgment day comes, you belong to God. The idea of the New Jerusalem being written on you when Judgment Day comes, guess where you're going to be going into? Heaven, the New Jerusalem. And in heaven, you're going to be given the new name. You remember we talked about this earlier? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I do have this in the notes. Revelation 14.1, I, I didn't need to, we need, need to read this verse to you. Now I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion with him, uh, 144,000 having the, his father's name written on their foreheads. So there it is. The idea is, you belong to me. You're sealed. Revelation 2 and verse 17. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name, which no one knows except him who receives it. So here again is the idea of the new name. This goes back again to Revelation 2. And the idea of a white stone with a new name, it shouldn't surprise you. By the way, I'm, I'll go back a step, a little bit, a little bit further back. There's only two angels whose names we know. Gabriel and Michael. Manoah, not Noah, Manoah. Manoah was Samson's father. 
Samson's mother was told that she was going to conceive and bear a Nazarite child, child with a Nazarite vow that was going to be applied to him. Later on, the angel that pronounced the birth of Samson came back, and Manoah was offering a sacrifice up to God. And he asked the angel, what's your name? This is, this is trivia. Does anybody know what the angel said? <laughs> That's not fair. You didn't even know who Manoah was, much less the answer to what was said by the angel. Uh, he can't give his name. He can't give his name. Do you remember when Jacob Israel was given his new name? He was wrestling with the angel. And he asked the angel, what's your name? Remember the answer? Can't tell you. The point I'm trying to make is to be given a name by God, a new name indicating you're mine, you're my child. In the Hebrew and even in our world, who gives the name to the child? The parents. And in ancient times, which parent primarily gave the name? The father. Do you, do you remember John the Baptist? Who gave the name? The father. The giving of a name is very crucial in ancient times. But to have your name given to you by God is one of the greatest honors you will ever have. Because for him giving you your name, you are his child. See how that works? You're his child. He gives you your new name. And again, the new name is between you and him. You and him. Okay. Revelation 19, 12. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. He has a name written that no one knows except himself. See that? No one knows except himself. That's going to be part of our future. You as a child of God will be given your name by God. And it will be between you and God. And then Revelation 3 and 13. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Another way of giving you, who has ears? Everybody, unless you're deaf, you can't hear. But if you got ears, and they work, the idea of hearing is more than just letting the ears work. It is receiving what's coming into the ears, into the heart and the mind, and understanding it and doing it. You can hear something with your ears and go, oh, okay, all right. The idea of hearing here is hear and react to it and obey it. Okay, let your brain rest. Flip the page over. How much time do we have left? Just about 10 more minutes. And so I'm going to go now to the church in Laodicea real quickly. Excuse me while I change over. Like the letter to the church in Philadelphia is nothing but good. The letter to Laodicea is nothing but bad. You don't want to be a Laodicea. In contrasting the two congregations, Laodicea thought, we don't need anything. We're doing good. We're doing great. They're probably a financially well-to-do congregation. If you know the history of the city of Laodicea, it was basically the hot springs of that part of the country. You know hot springs here? Well, they got hot springs. Hot springs. <laughs> so what they have in Laodicea, they are hot springs, okay? Do the hot springs draw wealthy people? Yeah, because they're told, you, you sit in this hot water with all these minerals in it, and it's going to make you healthy. Folks that got money, still do it today. I guarantee you today, right now in hot springs, there's some folks with some money that are going in to sit in some of those hot springs for health. That was Laodicea. They were also known for an eye salve that they made there. They were also known for black wool that was very valuable. So you see all of these things connect to money. Eye salve, medicine, which shouldn't surprise you, a town where you have medicine because of the springs, okay. Uh, but also the black wool. And so the point I'm trying to make, it was a town with a lot of wealthy people. A lot of wealthy people. There's a danger that comes with wealth. Have you ever known someone who determines the faithfulness of a congregation by how big its building is? Or how nice the building is? Yes, yes, and yes. 
There are people sometimes who will look at material wealth and determine spiritual strength. They will look at material things and determine spiritual strength and faithfulness. The size of a congregation and how nice your building is, it got nothing to do with the faithfulness of a congregation. Nothing. Let it go. The faithfulness of a congregation is dependent upon the brethren's relationship with God individually and collectively. That's what we're trying to get to. The congregation of Laodicea, let's just go ahead and read it. I've got seven more minutes, so I'm just going to read this. Verse 14, And to the messenger of the church of Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, at the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I can wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I got five minutes. We're not going to try to go over this in five minutes. (laughs) Okay. So next week when I come back to the text here, I'm not going to read it. I'm just going straight into the lesson, okay? I got five minutes here, and so I do want to go a little over a little bit of this. He refers to himself here as the amen, the faithful and true witness. Do you remember when Jesus was before Pontius Pilate? I'm just going to go off on my head here rather than the outline. Do you remember when Jesus said, for this purpose I came into the world to bear witness to what? The truth. Jesus came to bear witness to the truth about God, about himself, about us and our relationship with God, about sin, about hell, about Hades, about heaven, about how to be saved. He came to bring us the truth. And so he calls him here the faithful and true witness. He told us the truth about ourselves and God and himself, but he also spoke the truth whenever asked the question, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? What was his answer? I am. Did Jesus ever deny who he was, even if he was going to be persecuted for it? No. Jesus did not deny himself who he was and what he was. In the context here, these people who are Christians are being told to do exactly that, to deny who Christ is. Deny the Christ. Jesus did not deny himself. How did that work out for him? They crucified him. They killed him. So individuals who are going to speak the truth now, how's that going to work out for you? In in the congregation here. Yeah, you may die. You may die. He he calls them, I'm going to come back to some of this next week. Let's see. Lukewarm. How would you like to hear from God Almighty and the Lord Jesus Christ, you make me want to vomit? That is about the worst commentary you can get. Uh, and uh, to be told that you're miserable, wretched. Oh, Oh my. Lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. One foot in the world, one foot in the church. When you're around your people and your friends in the world, you talk like them, you act like them. When you're around your friends in the church, You act like them, you talk like them. One word for that is hypocrite. Actor. You're continually changing because whoever you're around. Trying to make everybody like you and everybody happy. A chameleon who changes depending on who he's around. Fake. Neither hot nor cold. Lukewarm. You're going to be seeing later on next week from James. Double-minded. Double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Again, double-minded is I'm over here and I'm over there. I got two sides. <laughs> it just depends on who I'm around. 
Jesus sees that in the way in which we live, and if that's our life, he wants to vomit. That's how we make him feel in our life like that. We are wretched and miserable. And so in the context here, we're going to be seeing where he's talking about things that open their eyes with eye salve and clothing. And, and so he's referring again to the trades of their city that made them physically wealthy. The danger with having money is you think everything's okay because we're doing well physically. Can you be doing really well physically and yet be lost spiritually? Yes. And that's one of the main lessons I want you to see here. We'll come back to this next week. How well you are doing physically does not mean necessarily that you're doing well spiritually. There's a lot of folks out there I fear sometimes that have made those connections thinking, God is okay with me because look how good things are working out. Remember, remember Laodicea. There was a way they saw themselves and there was a way God saw them. Bring this home to us. How does God see us? Where am I truly individually? How does God see me? And how does God see this congregation? I'm not a private investigator, and I don't have the ability to read your minds. So I really don't know where a lot of you are. It's just the way it is. God knows that. He knows where we really are. That's why, that's why he begins every one of these letters with, I know your works. See that phrase? I know your works. He knows where I am. So where I need to be is having my eyes open to where I can see where I am, to where I, where I see near, I need to repent and change, and then repent and change there. And wherever we need to repent and change as a congregation, do everything we can to repent and change as a congregation, because I want to be a congregation that's like Philadelphia and not Laodicea. And then I'll close with one last comment. Deciding which congregation you're going to place membership with is a difficult thing. But if you go into a congregation and you sense that they are dead, 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 why would you want to be a part of a dead congregation unless it's going to repent? Are you going to a congregation and there's open public sin and it's spreading everywhere and nobody cares about God's word? I would rather join myself to five brethren that are faithful than 5,000 that are going to hell. To follow that, I would rather join myself to five people that are faithful than 5,000 that are not. I would not want to be part of the Laodicean congregation. And uh, I would want to be part of the Philadelphia congregation. The point I'm trying to make is deciding which congregation you're going to worship at. Be picky, picky, picky. Like, you know, picky, picky, picky when you get married. Picky, picky, picky. Make sure that you join yourself to people that are really trying to serve God by faith, individually and collectively. Not a congregation that makes God want to vomit. All right, I'll stop right there.